All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter. Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Blazier, people represented by Mr. Miss Clark, Mr. Darden, Mr. Goldberg, and uh, Mr. Gordon. Morning, counsel. Morning, All right, counsel, anything we need to take up before we uh, proceed with the next witness? Yeah, Your Honor, on scheduling, uh, we submitted a letter to the court last week regarding Dr. Weir's testimony, and what we've proposed is that uh, we have the 402 hearing on Thursday and the testimony, if there's going to be testimony, on Friday morning. Uh, we won't get Dr. Weir's report until this afternoon, and uh, we also, there was a book that's been referred to that we have to get out to our experts, but we think we can work within that time frame. I, I described, discussed that with Mr. Harmon. I, he didn't seem to have any problems with it, but I won't speak for him. Mr. Harmon? Morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, that's no problem. I'm not sure what that does with the rest of our schedule, but he'll, Dr. Weir is here, so. We're trying to accommodate the fact that he's out of town next week. Okay. Our experts. What's your, uh, what is your time estimate on your presentation, uh, Ms. Blazier? We think everything can be done in a day. Okay. On the 402. All right. Does that meet your approval then, Mr. Uh, Harmon? Yes, Thursday? sir. All right. Then I should set aside the whole day for this hearing? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right, Mr. Gordon, good, after good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. The issue regarding uh, witnesses Holmes and Redford. Uh, you know, we presented the court with moving papers. Uh, <clears throat> these are two very discreet <laughs> incidents that are close in time, 194, <coughs> 192. Uh, highly probative. They fit well within the court's order. As I said, was we went through the further investigation we received, we called those down to find those incidents which fit squarely within the court's order. These two inc incidents fit squarely within the order that the court has come down in the court's ruling. I feel they're ex extremely probative. They fit within the pattern we are what we are attempting to do is to call down and pare down the evidence that we do have to uh, to present the case in a streamlined uh, a form as you can in what's upcoming, and uh, this evidence will assist us in doing that. It's extremely probative. One, you have a physical assault. The other, you have evidence of uh, stalking and unwanted pursuit in 1992. Uh, Mr. Gordon, your uh, moving papers indicate that discovery uh, was provided to the <coughs> defense, uh, and I would like to know specifically when it was that these reports were turned over to the defense. Let me check on that, sir. listed on the April 27th master witness list as to the dates that the actual reports were done. I believe it was, uh, well, let me check with Mr. Armstrong and the investigators if I could, Your Honor, All right. to get a specific date. That's a little bit outside my... Uh, All right, I'd like to know the specific date that, a, yes. that these reports were turned over. At least with regard to discovery from Mr. Darden's informed me, spoke to Mr. Cochran as the, if, depending on the court's order, they should be ready to go on the witnesses whenever the court uh, does rule. But let me check on the days for the court. time that those reports were prepared, we were operating under the uh, order of the court, wherein the court ordered us to provide discovery within one day, and so they were, they were turned over within one business day. All right, I'm just curious, time frame-wise, what we're talking about here. Mr. Gordon, uh, Mr. Uh, Darden advises me that uh, these reports were made available to the defense within one business day of the completion of the report as per the court's previous order. 
That's my understanding. I'm outside the discovery operation. February 23rd is the date of the interviews on the Holmes matter. I believe Red Firm was sometime in March, but I'm, uh, I'm checking after the court right now. All right, I have the uh, report, the Holmes report. Which are actually two separate short reports. The court should right. have both attached the motion. Both have a February 23rd date. All right, there is no date on the Giaconda Red Firm. And that's what I'm checking. My, my recollection, it was in March, and I'm checking that right now. So. All right. I'll hear from the defense. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Cochran. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Honor, with regard to these two items, um, I'm not clear on the dates that we got these actual reports. Um, I'll accept counsel's representation regarding that. The problem, however, Your Honor, is that uh, the court will recall we had a rather lengthy uh, hearing on this matter, I believe, back in January. And as I recall, on or about January 18th, the court issued a very, very lengthy ruling where you went to a lot of trouble to detail all these various discrete incidents and tell us what we could, what we could expect, what evidence would be admissible, and why, what evidence would not be admissible. And now, uh, to come up at the very end of trial and have uh, these two witnesses, specifically Holmes and uh, Redfern, uh, with these so-called discrete acts, I think uh, it's really unfair. We didn't have a chance to argue about these before. And uh, it puts us at a disadvantage. Now, uh, it's true there's not much in the way of reports regarding these two witnesses, and I think we now have all those reports. But this motion that detailed this, uh, the court will recall that I didn't actually get the motion, I don't think, until Friday. Uh, somebody handed it to me on this past Friday. I spoke to Mr. Darden this morning about it, and I, I said that we're at a real disadvantage from an investigatory standpoint, and uh, uh, although the reports are short, and I can read those and perhaps get ready from an investigatory standpoint, Having known the items that Your Honor said would be admissible, we're ready on those. Uh, these are separate items, which we've not had really a chance to investigate because it hadn't been an issue. So my question, the, the problem I really raise is, depending upon Your Honor's ruling, uh, although I can be ready, we would like some time to obviously sit and talk to our client about it. It hasn't been relevant because uh, to discuss with our client and also to have our investigators take a look at this also. And that's the only... Uh, that's my indication. I think there's some question about fairness regarding this because they had all these other issues. I mean, you, you counted them up. You had to do a chart to go through all of them. And uh, we dealt with those. And now we have these two. Uh, and then uh, now we're in a kind of a situation at the last minute where we have to scramble around, review all the reports, take time to talk to our client, and then perhaps also talk to our investigators, which we have not done in that regard. Because this was not anticipated these would be, uh, be called because they were never addressed to you. Well, let me anticipate Mr. Gordon's argument and ask you, Mr. Cochran. Mr. Gordon is going to argue that these reports were turned over in February and in March, and that in April, uh, late April, these two names were added to the prosecution's witness list. I'll have to check with Mr. Mr. Douglas with regard to that. That may well be true, Your Honor. But again, with regard to items of domestic discord, it seemed to me and it seems to us that it was pr the parameters were pretty well set by Your Honor in your ruling. And uh, it was not a situation, the court can, as the court has said so many times, we've been kind of busy in here as we go along with the evidence. And we kind of anticipated we will be dealing with the witnesses that were set forth at that time. So all I'm saying is that uh, there's an element of unfairness. I was just talking to my client about it. We've not had a chance to discuss this because you know, there's so many witnesses you know, set forth in this case on both sides. And uh, as you know, there are over 30,000, I guess, pages now of, of discovery. We, we get discovery every day in this case. So it makes it very difficult. And that's, that's the point we're faced with. All right, well, when you say you need additional time since this motion was served upon you as I recollect here in court last Thursday or Friday, yes. how much time are you asking for? Um, gee, Your Honor, I, may, I, uh, may I have a second to talk to, talk to my client about this? Because I need, obviously, to talk with him and to talk to our investigators on this point. May I have a second? Certainly. Thank you, Your Honor. May I respond just briefly, Your Honor? Well, I, uh, yes, sir.
um, I've discussed the matter with my client, and also Mr. Douglas advises me that we were able to apparently interview a couple of these witnesses over this weekend, because we want to get this case over also, Your Honor. So I would ask that um, the court will give us um, a couple of days, perhaps Wednesday or Thursday, we can, we'll, we'll be ready by then. Is that okay? All right. Apparently. Mr. Gordon? Actually, call the witnesses, or to, I'm a little bit unclear on exactly what the deal is. No, I think for. I think they want the opportunity. You served the motion that you were going to call these witnesses to argue the admissibility. I take it in a 402 hearing. Uh, Certainly. So I'll I'll hear that Wednesday, and Certainly. if you get a favorable ruling on one or both, you should have those witnesses available. They, they're certainly going to be available. The one thing I would note to the court is that the original 402 brought. Excuse me, just a second, counsel. Excuse me, gentlemen. Lee, Lee. Mr. Bailey, Mr. Goldberg, keep it down, would you please? Certainly, Honor, just to bring in the court's attention and for the record, the original 402 brought by the defense, we listed those incidents that were, were known at that time. We indicated to the court and defense that this investigation was continuing. No, I, I recollect, and you told me that there were ongoing phone Certainly. calls and information coming in all Certainly. the time. I'm, I'm not surprised to hear this, but counsel is entitled since they didn't get the motion until. Certainly, sir. Thank you for Friday. Your consideration. All right, Thank Wednesday. You, Thank you. Wednesday. Wednesday. Right, what's the domestic violence issues then? Domestic discord issues will be fine to be done at that point. All right. All right, counsel, I have received from the uh, California Department of Justice two additional uh, DNA reports from uh, Mr. Sims and Ms. Montgomery. And let me ask uh, Ms. Martinez, would you uh, come forward, please? Give one copy to each side, please. Yes, one, one each. And this is a report dated by Mr. Sims and Ms. Montgomery, June 16. Also, I have received uh, two large packages from the uh, Department of Justice Bureau of Forensic Sciences, two additional packages. And let me give the original to the prosecution and a co copy to the defense on this as well. Thank you. All right, counsel, anything else before the uh, prosecution calls their next witness? Can we just on the record, we've had some informal conversations. Can we get, uh, again, a statement that the people's cases have got shifting here at the end? Can we get a definitive statement about the order of witnesses again, where we're going to go this week so we'll know and we can prepare and I can get lawyers here? Ms. Clark, have we finished the gloves? For now. For now. All right, then I, we were supposed to have shoes, domestic violence, and DNA with air touch and hair and trace and fiber. That's fine. In that order. That's what I think. All right, so I should expect shoes next? Yes. Shoes today? Yes, right now. And how many witnesses are you going to be calling besides Mr. Boziak? Okay, who is that? All right. I just have one question. What's our schedule for tomorrow morning? Uh, my recollection is one of our jurors has to attend a uh, graduation somewhere quite distant, and uh, I think we're going to break at approximately 3.30. I thought I knew that. Right. It's been on the calendar for... Well, Mr. Cochran, I'll ask the juror if. All right. All right. Anything else before we invite the jurors to join us, Your Mr. Honor, Darden? On the glove issue. Yes. Uh, we are going to revisit that issue again. I don't know which day, and I would ask that Mr. Cochran keep his file relative to the glove uh, handy. Which which issue are you talking about? The glove. They haven't had the gloves yet, Your Honor. Okay. Well, we'll be ready. Okay. All right. Anything else? Great. All right, Deputy Magnero, let's have the jurors, please.
Let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, the uh, people may call their next witness. Mr. Goldberg, have you been handling this witness? Yes, Your Honor. All right, good morning, sir. Thank you. You may morning. proceed. People call Bill Bodziak to the stand. Good morning. William J. Bodziak, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, middle initial J, the last name is spelled B-O-D-Z-I-A-K. Mr. Goldberg. Good morning. Good morning. Sir, what is your occupation and your assignment? I'm a special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'm currently assigned in the FBI laboratory as an examiner of question document, footwear, and tire tread evidence. And have you had some training and experience that qualifies you for that position? Yes, sir, I have. I'd like to uh, first start with your formal training and experience. Uh, did you have a university degree? Yes, I have a BA degree in biology from East Carolina University, and I have a master's degree in forensic science from George Washington University. And can you just briefly tell us what that forensic science degree, the master's that you referred to, involves? The forensic science degree is approximately half graduate forensic science courses, and the other half of, of the courses are dedicated to law and criminology. What year did you graduate with this uh, master's? Uh, 1976. Okay. And uh, turning to your experience at the FBI, when did you join the Federal Bureau of Investigation? I entered on duty in January of 1970. What was your capacity when you uh, first entered? I entered as a special agent and my first capacity for three years was as an investigative field agent in the New Haven and Baltimore divisions. So in approximately 1973, you were transferred to another division? Yes, sir. What was that? I was transferred to the FBI laboratory. And why were you transferred to the laboratory? Uh, I was transferred there to uh, begin training in the areas of question documents, footwear, and tire trade impressions. Who do they select for that kind of a position? Uh, the FBI had, at the time, a science program that intentionally brought in agents with science backgrounds to potentially bring back to the laboratory for those assignments. And was this something that you were interested in? Yes, sir, it was. Now, uh, when you were first assigned to the laboratory division in 1973, what was your first assignment? Uh, my first assignment in 1973 was to begin training, which was a three-year course of training in the laboratory where I would work cases, uh, hundreds of cases over those years, every day under the direct supervision of the senior examiners. Okay, and in addition to uh, doing documents, are there other kinds of things that you do in that section? Uh, documents including footwear and tire impression evidence. And how long have you actually been conducting examinations on footwear impression evidence? Uh, shortly after arriving in 1973 and beginning that casework uh, training, uh, I was introduced to uh, footwear and tire trading analysis as well. And is that what you have done in this case, is to uh, provide an analysis of some, ta uh, of some uh, footwear impression evidence? Yes, sir, in this I have. Case. Yes. Now, do we have a chart that's, uh, that we can use to illustrate the kinds of analysis that you've been doing in the FBI laboratory in general terms uh, since 1973 in terms of footwear impression evidence? Yes. And would that be helpful to you in, in describing the kinds of um, techniques that you performed and the analysis that you performed there? Yes, it would. Your Honor, I'd like to mark as people's next in order a chart entitled What Shoe Prints Can Show, and I believe that's 373. People's 373. <coughs> Sir, directing your attention to what we've marked as People's 373 for identification, the section that says, if recovered, shoes of a suspect may be identified or eliminated. Can you describe for us, and if you, if you need to step down, you may do so, uh, what kind of analysis you've performed I I that's uh, signified by this portion of the chart? Okay. May I step down, Your Honor? You may. Directing the attention to the top portion of the chart, one of the primary purposes of footwear comparison is ultimately to examine 
the footwear uh, impressions from the crime scene, which is depicted here on the right side, with shoes of suspects that might be obtained during the investigation. In this particular chart, I've shown, uh, as an example, on the right, an impression from a crime scene, uh, a test impression made from the shoe of the suspect, and on the left side, a reverse photograph of the shoe of the suspect. This comparison involves the class characteristics first of the shoe, that is the physical shape and size, the design or pattern on the bottom of the shoe, which leaves its print in the impression, and then subsequently will draw its attention to wear characteristics, where the heel may begin to wear on the edge, and other wear that might be evident and would change the pattern of the shoe. The fourth area of comparison after the size, design, and wear would be things such as accidental characteristics, such as a cut mark that would also show up in the impression and would be found on both the test impression and the known shoe. These cut marks or changes to the pattern of the shoe are what makes a shoe unique and would possibly enable, if there was an adequate number of these, uh, the positive identification of this shoe having made uh, the impression at the crime scene. Now, did you do that kind of analysis in this case? No, I did not. Why was that? There were no shoes that were given to me of the suspects. All right. Now, in cases that are submitted to you for analysis at the FBI uh, w w uh, since 1973 when you've been working there, uh, can you give us an estimate as to what percent, when they're submitted to you, they do not have shoes of a suspect? Uh, approximately 40% of the casework that's submitted to us initially does not have the shoes of the suspect. A few of those may be submitted later after we provide them additional information. And are there some where the shoes are never recovered? Absolutely, yes. Now, in cases where the shoes are not recovered, is it nevertheless possible to do uh, other kinds of analysis on the shoes? Yes. Well, and is that uh, indicated uh, on the chart? Yes, the, the second and third portions of the chart uh, draw the attention to those kinds of requests we get in situations where we do not have the shoes of a suspect. And we are asked to provide the brand name and manufacturer of the shoe, and we do this by accumulating in a reference collection uh, thousands of designs of shoes and searching a particular pattern from the crime scene print through that reference collection, and hopefully we'll be able to determine the manufacturer and brand name of that shoe. After that, depending on the uh, quality of the impression and the completeness of the impression at the crime scene, as well as the kind of manufacturer of the shoe in question, we may be asked to give either a general estimate of the size, and that would be just through a linear, linear measurement, or an actual uh, specific sizing of the shoe by directly working with the manufacturer. Right, and these last two portions of the chart that you've discussed where it says brand name, manufacturer, shoe, and size of the shoe, where, did you perform that kind of analysis in this particular yes, case? Yes, sir, I did. All right, thank you. You may resume the stand if you like. Now, Mr. Bodziak, uh, returning to your uh, qualifications in the area of shoe print examination, are you a member of some professional organizations in the area of uh, forensic science? Yes, sir, I am. And do you have a curricula vita that summarizes your various uh, experience and training? Yes, sir, I do. And, sir, are you a, a fellow of the document section of the American Academy of Forensic Science? Yes, sir, I am. Does that have certain uh, entrance requirements? Yes, it, it has basic educational and experience edu uh, uh, requirements for entrance. In other words, you would have to be working in that field for a number of years and have people that would recommend you as a, a viable candidate. Are you also a member of the International Association for Identification since uh, 1988? Yes, I am. Are you a member of any subcommittees of that organization? Yes, the, the International Association for Identification, known as the IAI, uh, instead of calling their individual components dedicated to specific areas of forensic science sections, they call them subcommittees. And I'm a member of the subcommittee on footwear and tire track compression evidence. And are you a provisional member of the American Society of uh, Question Document Examiners? Yes, sir, I am. Are you also a certified diplomat of the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners? Yes, sir, I am. And are you associated with the International Association of Forensic Science? Yes, I am. Does that have a formal membership, that organization? The International Association of Forensic Science is an international organization which does not have regular membership. Uh, it meets every three years in a different country, 
and the organization for that particular meeting is made by the country which hosts it. Did you chair any meetings of that organization related to footwear and tire tread type evidence? Yes, I chaired the section on footwear and tire impression evidence in Vancouver in 1987, uh, in Adelaide, Australia in 1990, and in Dusseldorf, Germany in 1993. Did you make pr presentations at those three meetings? Yes, sir, I did. Now, in addition to uh, your membership, do you also, in these various organizations, do you also have some teaching experience? Yes, I do. Can you tell us what that consists of? There is a one-week course in the examination of footwear impression evidence at our FBI Academy, which I have taught since 1983. And have you also published some articles in the area of uh, footwear impression evidence? Yes, sir, I have. Did you publish an article that appeared in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin entitled Shoe and Tire Impression Evidence in 1984? Yes, I did. And did you uh, publish another article entitled Manufacturing Processes for Athletic Shoe Outsoles and Their Significance in the Examination of Footwear Impression Evidence in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 1986? Yes, I did. And did you co-author another article entitled A Forensic Evaluation of the air bubbles present in polyurethane shoe outsoles as applicable in footwear impression comparisons, also uh, published in the Journal of Forensic Science in 1988. Yes, I did. Who did you author that with? Uh, I arth authored it with Doreen Music of the Los Angeles Police Department. And is she uh, with their, um, is she a footprint examiner at she, that organization? She was at the time, yes. Okay. Now, in addition to the articles that we just mentioned, did you also author a book entitled Footwear Impression Evidence? Yes, sir, I did. That was in 1990? That was initially published by Elsevier Sciences Publishing Company in 1990, and the book rights have been taken over by CRC Press. Now, uh, turning to your involvement in this case, when you first became involved in the case, what type of analysis were you asked to perform? Uh, initially, I was asked to determine what type of shoe, what brand or manufacturer type of shoe made the impressions that were located in blood on the Bundy sidewalk. And did you uh, consult any reference collections of the sort that you mentioned uh, previously in order to do that? Yes, I did. I initially consulted the FBI's reference collection, which uh, involves thousands of impressions on computer and in photographs and catalogs, but I was unable to find that particular design. And how long has this reference collection been in existent, existence? Well, we have uh, changed it over the years, but it was initially started in 1937, basically as a rubber heel file. Is it a computerized system? A uh, part of it is computerized, yes, sir. All right. And you were unable to locate the design in uh, your, your reference uh, catalog? That's correct. Now, after you were unable to locate the, the design uh, based upon your own resources, did you take some additional steps? Yes, I did. What did you do? Uh, in looking at the um, detail in the shoe impressions in the 30 photographs which I was submitted, um, which were the impressions from the Bundy location, uh, I observed that there were certain features about that shoe uh, that strongly suggested that it was a high-end, uh, that is a very expensive Italian brand shoe. So I looked through our written reference material and I, I identified uh, approximately 75 to 80 manufacturers and importers of uh, high-end Italian shoes and, and some South American shoes or Brazilian shoes. And I prepared a sketch and a, uh, one of the photographs, a composite photograph, uh, excuse me, a composite sketch and three photographs of heel impressions from the Bundy scene, along with a letter and contacted those manufacturers and importers to see if they recognized or knew the origin of that particular design. Did you get any uh, information back as a result of that? Yes. Uh, on August 17th, I re received a reply from a Mr. Peter Gruderich of the Bruno Mali UMA shoe store in New Jersey. And uh, <clears throat> did he send you anything? Yes, he sent me uh, two shoes that were left over from a Bruno Mali distribution uh, of his in 1991 and 1992. Uh, these were both right shoes. One was a size nine and a half and one was a size 12. And I believe uh, from looking at them, they were probably samples uh, that were just left over. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to mark as people's next in order a chart 
I'm sorry, 374. Yes, 374. A chart that's entitled uh, Bruno Mogli, and it has uh, Lorenzo and Lyon shoes. All right, so Mark. Mr. Bodziak, directing your attention to People's 374 for identification, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that? Uh, this, these are enlarged photographs on the right side of the Lorenzo at the top and uh, the Lion or Leon at the bottom. The difference between those two shoes is the Lorenzo has a higher uh, heel collar to it and the, the Leon or Lion has a, a lower cut as a conventional shoe would have. And those uh, shoes were sent to me by Mr. Gruderich. Uh, the retail of those was approximately $160, and they were Bruno Molly shoes distributed in 1991 and 92 in six different colors. The colors were white, black, brown, uh, blue, brandy, and uh, olive. Are there any design features of the uh, shoe that you can point out to us of significance in terms of your analysis? Uh, only the point that I've already mentioned that the Lorenzo and uh, Leon are different primarily because one is more of a high top shoe uh, and the Leon or Lion is a lower cut around the heel. Okay. And uh, you actually received the shoes themselves as well? Yes, sir, I did. And at this time, I'd like to mark as People's 375 for identification a uh, box and its contents of Bruno Mali shoes. All right, box and content, Bruno Mali shoes, 375. I'm going to write a little 375 on the top of the box. Thank you. Sir, showing you uh, people's 375 for identification. Can you tell us what that is? <clears throat> Exhibit 375 are the two shoes, the Line or Leon and the Lorenzo, which were submitted to me by Mr. Peter Gruderich and which were left over from the shipment or distribution of those shoes in 1991 and 1992. And uh, if, you, if you look, can hold up one of them, uh, the, again, I think it's the uh, Lorenzo. It appears to be faded a little bit on one side. Yes, uh, the left side of this shoe is much darker than the uh, right side, which appears to maybe have been in a window and uh, is, is somewhat discolored. Okay. Is that the condition they were in when you got them? Yes, sir, it is. Now, uh, in addition to the um, information that you sent out that you just told us about to these shoe manufacturers, did you send out any other inquiries to law enforcement agencies? Uh, yes. Uh, also sending, uh, I sent an inquiry to eight international laboratories which uh, I knew had computerized reference collections such as the FBI. And I sent them uh, pictures of the um, sole of the shoe as well as the uh, pictures from the crime scene, a couple pictures from the crime scene at Bundy, and asked them the same question, if could they identify the brand name or manufacturer of this shoe. Were any of those countries with computerized systems uh, similar to the FBI's able to provide you with any information? Yes, seven of them uh, responded and said they did not have this shoe in their collection. The uh, eighth one, the National Police Agency in Tokyo, Japan, responded and advised that they had a shoe that they had obtained from a merchant uh, of this design that was distributed in Europe and was made in Italy. Now, as a result of the information that you've just uh, talked to us about, did you determine who the manufacturer was of the Bruno Mali shoe? Yes, well, if I could comment on the bottom of the shoe, which has the manufacturer's sure. name on it. The bottom of the shoe, uh, has design elements. Um, may I step down? Okay. <clears throat> the bottom of the shoe has design elements which are repeated across the entire sole area as well as the heel. And these design elements which uh, repeat one uh, after one another across the width and length of the shoe 
are identical in size in both the heel and the uh, sole. And they are surrounded by a perimeter, a little raised line. And then there's an outer perimeter, which does not actually touch the surface of the ground, but which is a little bit raised, but will can touch it if there's enough weight or uh, other factors. The same is true of the heel. And the leading edge of the heel is curved and has the uh, notch cut off of the medial side, the inner side. This is a reverse photograph, so this is actually the left an enlargement of the left shoe. And this would be the outside of the body, and this would be the inside to the right as you look at it. And in the center uh, arch area, there is the name Bruno Mali. Uh, that's B-R-U-N-O-M-A-G-L-I. Uh, as well as the capital M for Bruno Mali, their logo in the middle of that. And at the very bottom uh, in the shadow here, which is probably hard to see, is the words Made in Italy. And up in the top corner here is the word Silga, S-I-L-G-A, which to answer your question, this is the manufacturer in Italy of this outsole. Okay. Now, is that common in the footwear industry that the company that's name goes on the shoe doesn't necessarily have their own factories that they own? Uh, that's very common in the footwear industry to have one company make the outsoles and sell those to another company that will then uh, create the uppers which are attached and glued and stitched to the bottoms. So so what is the Bruno Mali company? Is it a, it's, if it's not a shoe factory, it's a what? Well, it, it may also be a shoe factory, okay. but they may, I don't know their full habits of purchasing, but with regard to this shoe, they had this mold made by Silga for their shoes, and then these molds, these molded bottoms were sent to another factory, which was called 4C, also in Italy, in the same area of Italy, and the uppers were stitched and then placed into the bottoms and, and made and sold as a shoe. Okay. Now, after you made these uh, determinations, Mr. Bodziak, and you can resume the stand if you like. As to the uh, manufacturer of the sole of the Bruno Mali shoe and also the upper, did you uh, decide to visit the factories, these two, two factories? Yes, I did. And before getting into that, do you have some training and experience specifically in shoe manufacturing? Yes. Uh, over the years, uh, since the late 70s, I've been to approximately, uh, footwear manufacturers, approximately 25 occasions. And what is the purpose of trying to gather information about how shoes are manufactured from the standpoint of a forensic uh, shoe examiner? Uh, in some cases, the purpose is because of the, of the need to in a particular case that I might be working. But as a general training tool, it's important to learn the various ways that shoes can be manufactured because there's quite a, a lot of differences between a direct attach injection molded shoe or a a cut shoe uh, that's uh, made of unvulcanized rubber or a compression molded shoe. Okay. And uh, are you able to uh, use this information in your analysis in determining shoe size that left impressions at a crime scene? Yes, sir. Now, is this something that you are routinely able to do based on that kind of information and other information? Yes, sir. Now, do we have some uh, charts that can be used in order for you to illustrate for us how it is that this kind of a uh, determination of shoe size can be made. Yes, sir. I'd like to mark as people's 276 for identification, a chart, excuse me, 376, a chart entitled Determination of Shoe Size. So marked. Sir, so directing your attention to uh, people's two, excuse me, 376 for identification. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And can you tell us what the uh, top portion of the chart under nonspecific sizing refers to? Yes, uh, nonspecific sizing is what I would uh, label as instances when we were submitted partial impressions from a crime scene or impressions that we could never specifically identify as having been made by a specific manufacturer. And because of those uh, characteristics and not being able to, to link them to a specific manufacturer, uh, we would only be able to give an estimate, and sometimes a very rough estimate, of the approximate size based on the impressions that we had from the crime scene. 
and this would be, uh, like I say, a very rough estimate, but in nonspecific sizing would be what I would call that. Now, in cases where you do have the information as to who manufactured the shoe, uh, what can you do? In that case, we can specifically size the shoe if it has been made in certain manners. If it's been cut from a sheet of goods and then just glued to the bottom, uh, that's usually not possible uh, with an absolute 100% certainty. But if the shoe has been molded and the molds have been made uh, with a hand milled method where the person is actually guiding the milling device and creating the mold uh, through their personal uh, direction as opposed to a computer method, uh, then each of those molds, both in different sizes as well as molds uh, that may be duplicated in uh, the same size, each of those will come out slightly different. And those differences will manifest themselves in the impressions at the crime scene and enable a direct comparison to eliminate the molds that did not make the shoe and identify the mold which did make the shoe. And is the, the testimony that you just gave as to determining a shoe size summarized on this chart? Uh, yes, it is. Now, using the uh, lower portion of the chart, can you explain for us in a, a little bit uh, more detail what it is that you can uh, determine from a hand milled mold. Yes, I mentioned that the molds would vary because of. And again, the, if you need to step down, you. I, might I think I can do it okay. from here. The hand, the molds were uh, would vary because the person's hands would be involved in it, and they would not be directed by a computer. And I placed uh, arrows uh, on uh, two molds here. The drawings represent two molds of the same size. And because a pattern or template is used, uh, it is transferred in a different manner each time when they route out or hand mill the mold. And the arrows showing the exact resulting positions of the design, in this case, uh, the circles and the zigzag or herringbone pattern, and where those circles and pattern touch the perimeter of the shoe, those will vary uh, both within the same size and uh, between different sizes. So, for example, uh, on the uh, two shoe sketches, if we're referring to the portion that has the arrow that relates to the zigzag, it, it appears that the shoe on the left starts with a, a zag and then has a zig, and the other one has a zig and then a zag. Is, is that correct? That's your terminology. Okay. Uh, if I may use the pointer, uh, on the right-hand side, what I was uh, stating is that the, this zigzag is going in a downward direction at an identical point in the heel where at this same point in the heel it's going in an upward direction and almost parallel to the corner. Even though the size and shape features of the zigzag are the same because they're from the same original pattern, it's the point at which they meet the perimeter which is most clearly shows the differences. The same would apply to the circle. Okay. Do we have another chart that's designed to uh, indicate how it is that this phenomena occurs with yes. hand milled molds? And I'd like to mark as people's next in order, it's 377 for identification, a chart entitled Hand Milled Molds, or how hand milled molds are made. So Mark. Directing your attention to the top of this chart, Mr. Bodziak, where, where it says a design pattern is used in the hand uh, milling of a mold. What does that refer to? Uh, what I'm referring to at the top of the chart is basically a pattern or template. And this would be, uh, for demonstration purposes, one which had, again, the zigzag or herringbone pattern and the circles. And this would be larger than the resultant mold, and it would either be a plastic template or some other type of pattern that the person would use as a reference or guide uh, to control the direction of the routing device, which would chew out the metal from the steel block and create the actual steel or aluminum mold which the shoe is molded in. And using the bottom portion of the chart, can you indicate for us how it is that this process can uh, result in variations each time you create a mold using that same template? What this shows at the bottom, and I have made one of these herringbone rows a different color to draw the attention to that. Uh, this would be the template, and we'll use the yellow or gold line as a reference point. And this would represent uh, the block of steel or aluminum that the uh, hand operator would 
route out in this pattern using this as a pattern device or as a guide. And even though at first look these two shoe designs seem to be the same, uh, looking at the exact configuration and direction, particularly, particularly easy to see what, at the perimeter uh, from one shoe to the next, <clears throat> and specifically looking at the gold line for demonstration purposes, you can see that the resultant pattern is different from one mold to the next, even though they are the same size. So does that mean, sir, that if you have two molds that were created with the same template, that as a forensic uh, shoe print examiner, you would be able to distinguish those two molds? Yes, sir. And is that based upon the placement, the exact placement of the mold with respect to the perimeter of the shoe? It's, it's based on the fact that in the hand milling process, as opposed to a uh, process where you make duplicate ca uh, molds from the beginning or a computer process, where the computer, of course, is going to do exactly the same thing every time with a CAD CAM device. Uh, in the hand milling process, each of these patterns will result in a slightly different position each time. Okay. Now, is there, uh, are there some other factors that you take into account when you're trying to determine uh, shoe sizing issues? Yes, there is. And do we have another chart that's designed to illustrate some of those other factors? Yes. And I'd like to mark as people's 378 for identification, a chart entitled Other Factors Contributing to Shoe Size. So marked. Sir, directing your attention to people's 378 for identification, can you tell us what the top portion of the chart refers to? Yes, the top portion of a, of a chart depicts what is known in the footwear industry as a LAST, L-A-S-T. And this is, was originally years ago always in wood, but nowadays it's normally uh, aluminum or uh, a hard plastic. And it's, it's basically a foot form, represents the uh, size and shape of a foot that would be used to stitch and stretch the upper of the shoe over and then the upper would be tacked around the bottom of it and then that would be placed on top of the molded bottom and that molded bottom would be glued or stitched to the, to the upper. And how is it that this factors into determining the size of a shoe? Because the size and shape features of the last are going to denote the width, the height of the instep, uh, the width of the heel, not the bottom of the heel but the top as well. Uh, they're going to be quite a bit different in uh, high-heeled shoes of ladies uh, versus uh, work boots of a man versus hip boots versus uh, athletic shoes. And so those features, uh, because they allow and, and control the room in the upper of the shoe, they are going to be a factor in the eventual fit of that shoe to a particular person. And what are the other factors that are discussed on this chart? <clears throat> The uh, second portion refers just generally to the fact that uh, the physical size and shape as well as size considerations of shoes uh, drastically different, such as high heel shoes, athletic shoes, and work boots, uh, obviously are different because of the type of construction, even though they might accommodate the same size foot. All right, and what is the choice of uh, which sizing system is used, refer to? The choice of which sizing system used lists uh, the common sizing systems used in the world. The top row, which is labeled centimeters, and the bottom row, which is labeled inches, are just linear measurements for reference. They are not sizing systems. But the European method, which goes uh, from 0 to 48 on this chart, if I can see from here, and the uh, English or British system, the United Kingdom, and the American size for men and then the U.S. lady sizes are laid down in this diagram or chart uh, showing the relative conversion factors or equivalents. For instance, if I may step down. Yes, sure. Um, the, for instance, the, a size 42 European, uh, let me first say that the distance between each size in the European is different than the distance between each size in the English and American. The difference in sizes between English and American are each a third of an inch uh, each size or half size, but the European is different. So when trying to, when an American person travels to Europe and 
they go to buy a shoe that's, that's made for a European market and not to be sold in America, they will have to look at the sizes such as 38, 40, 42, and so forth, and try to find the American equivalent size that they normally would wear in America. And that would be a starting point for them if trying on shoes uh, to see if that shoe fit. Uh, for instance, looking at a 42, it coincidentally uh, lines up uh, very well with the British size 8, uh, but not very well with the American size. They're more like an 8 and a half or 8 and in between an 8 and an 8 and a half. But the 38, co or excuse me, the 40 coincidentally lines up just right with the American. Uh, a 44 uh, is a little bit more than an American 10 and a 46 falls between uh, the 11 and a half and 12. And so those would simply be equivalents. So if you were to go into a shoe store uh, in America, you might find on the label US size uh, 10, uh, and then also perhaps the United Kingdom size, the, the equivalent, and the European equivalent. Okay, now is, are these comparisons that you've, that you've just made between the European and American sizes such that that you know for sure that any given European shoe of a, of a particular size can automatically be converted to an American shoe no, because using this conversion be method? Because the, uh, of the fact that there are other factors in the shoe in addition to just the size of the sole and the fact that in most instances the European size doesn't line up directly with the American or British size, uh, there would have to be some decision as to which size that shoe would be made on and what it would be called. Okay. And uh, are there some other factors that are in addition to the ones that are on this chart that also go into the issue of shoe size? Yes, there are. May I? Yes. <clears throat> yes, there's other factors. One that's very important is the personal preference of fit. Some people, uh, for instance, if they're buying a soccer shoe, may prefer it to be very tight. If they're buying a uh, dress shoe, uh, they may prefer it to be uh, loose so they don't have to go into that breaking in period. If the shoe's in a very expensive leather shoe, they may know that in a couple wearings it will be very soft and pliable and will stretch to their foot and they may like that fit so they may intentionally buy it a little more snug. So there is a lot of factors involving personal preference that play into account. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, would it be fair to say, just to, to summarize this issue of shoe sizing, that there are more factors that go into it than the, a lay person might imagine? Absolutely. Now, did you uh, receive some additional evidence from Bruno Mali and uh, Siegla companies in terms of some uh, sole samples? Yes, I did. Who was that from? Uh, I contacted the uh, Silga company, which is in the, on the eastern side of Italy, and which possessed the 10 molds from size 38 to size 47 uh, of this design. And I obtained samples in the range of 42 through 47 for comparison purposes. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to mark as People's 379 for identification a uh, series of outsoles 42 through 47. Uh, they're in a box, so it would be the box and its content. All right, box net content, 379. And I'll write a um, 379 on it. I wrote it on the piece of paper. Sir, showing you people's 379 for identification. received from um, Silga. You want me to take them all out or just? Sure, just take one out just to describe for us what, what it is that you okay. got and how it factored into your analysis. Okay, the, this is the uh, 
<clears throat> this is the compression molded sole, and I received a left and right for size 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, and 47. Uh, the company refers to it as their U2887 mold, and that is molded in the back of it, as well as the European size. The European size is on this sole because it is made in Italy, which is, of course, Europe, and so that is the sizing system that they would typically put on their molds and their soles when they make it. Uh, this is the same uh, size sole. This one's a 46, which was on one of the prior displays and shows the uh, different design elements and the different aspects of uh, this shoe design. Okay. Uh, for instance, this is a size 42, and there's quite a bit of difference uh, between the 42 and the 46. And it is that reason that I did not ask for the 38, 39, 40, and 41, because they were literally tiny compared to uh, the larger impressions that we had. Now, Mr. It, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Did you, uh, uh, on uh, January the 23rd of 1995, actually go to Italy to visit the Silga factory and the 4C factory? Yes, I did. And which facility did you go to first? I went to the Silga factory first, where they actually have the molds and through a compression molding process, manufacture the out, what I call the outsole or the sole unit uh, of the shoe. And do we have another chart with some photographs on it to show uh, what you saw when you were observing the manufacturing process at Silga and then 4C? Yes, sir, we do. I'd like to mark that as 370, excuse me, 380 for identification. 380. Now, sir, showing you uh, this diagram, excuse me, the, the series of photographs and the top part. It says Silga Factory A, B, and C. Using those photographs, can you describe for us what you saw when you were observing the manufacturing process of the Silga sole? Okay, yeah, I'd like to point to a few things if sure. I Sure. Just. The top three pictures are pictures that I took at the Silga Factory in Italy. On the left, it shows a bottom and top of a compression mold. Uh, the point I'm part pointing to, which is to the right, or actually in the center of the photograph, is the bottom of the mold, and that is the part of the mold which would have the pattern and design, and also the uh, logo that says Bruno Mali in it. And to the left, uh, in the southwest corner of this photograph, is the upper, and that would be the portion uh, which puts the design in the back of the sole a sort of a honeycomb uh, design. And just to the right of it, of course, is a couple soles which were happened to be there at the time. Uh, and this is known as compression molding or an open mold process because like a waffle iron, they will put the uh, pre-measured rubber in this mold cavity with this portion over top of it and they will mold it. It will melt and conform uh, each time to the exact size and shape features and come out of the mold the same size and shape each time. In the photograph marked B at the top uh, is a close-up showing the heel cavity of one of these molds and in particular showing the words made in Italy which I previously uh, pointed to on the outsole which are just in front of the heel and also there is a oval area and removed uh, that's normally where the name goes, Bruno Mali, but the slug, which is removable, is sitting next to that mold. And this was the purpose of taking this picture, was to show that this can be removed. The factory has another set of slugs which have the name Lord, L-O-R-D, on them. And that was the name on the shoe that the National Police Agency in Japan had identified uh, <clears throat> as part of their reference collection from Europe. Uh, there is also a little circular area between the heel and the oval area, 
And this, at this point, it's blank. But if these shoes, soles were made in Europe, the European size, such as 42, 46, 47, would, would go there if they desired to have them on the bottoms. And there was one other name that they did have uh, that went into this area. Uh, I can never remember how to spell it, but it's A-N-T-I-C-A, and I believe the last name is C-U-O-R-I-C-I-A or C-A, and it basically means uh, tradition of fine shoemaking in Italian, I'm told, and it was only for display shoes. They had never sold a shoe with that name on it, and they only had a couple of those slugs. They didn't have them for every mold. Uh, on the right is, under C on the chart, is a compression molding oven. And once the biscuit of rubber has been put in uh, the cavity of the mold and this top has come down, been placed on top of it, it will then be pushed into this oven and the oven will close and under heat and pressure it will cause the melting of that biscuit of rubber and the resultant uh, sole, rubber sole in the same size and shape each time. I obtained a pair of these size 46 soles and hand carry them to the Silga factory, I'm mean, sorry, the 4C factory. Okay, uh, hold, hold on for a sec, because I had a couple questions sure. I wanted to ask about the Silga. When you were at Silga, did you look at um, only one mold or, or a variety of different molds? I examined all of the molds from size 38 to 47. Okay. And then when you uh, left Silga, what did you have with you? I had a pair of size 46 left and right sole. And where did you go with those? I then went to the 4C factory, which was uh, a few miles down the road. And that is the factory which Bruno Mali had commissioned to make the uppers of their shoe and glue those uppers to the molded soles. Uh, picture number D shows in the background, slightly out of focus, a shoe that is being, uh, a glue is being applied to. And in the foreground, uh, in the center of the photograph, the outsole, which is having some glue applied to it. This glue is applied, it's allowed to cure, and then before the two are put together, it's reactivated with heat to give sort of a contact uh, cement arrangement. In photograph E, uh, the person there is taking a upper of the shoe and right next to his thumb there's a little bit of green that you can see and that's part of the last that was used to have the upper of the sh uh, shoe stitched around. So the green thing is actually, actually inside the part shoe. Of, part of a last which you can see over an F. Uh, and he is taking the molded rubber sole from Silga that has had glue applied and he's pressing them together very carefully to position them right. He is then going to put them in this machine to the right, which will apply uniform pressure for a period of time to assure that the contact of that cement is complete. Uh, after that, in order to get the shoe, uh, which is very tightly stretched around that last, off of the last, uh, it is turned over and put on this metal rod, which has a little pin coming up uh, and fits into a hole in the last and the toe of the shoe is pushed upward, which breaks this last down so uh, in a manner that you would if you were sliding your foot out of a shoe, and it allows them to remove the shoe from the last, and then, of course, uh, put the shoelaces on and sell the shoes. Now, why is it that this particular shoe is in leather as opposed to suede? Well, the, when I went to the factory, of course, they were no longer making the shoes that were only made in 1991 uh, and 92 for Bruno Mali. They're still making, these are Bruno Mali shoes. They're the same lasts. These are, this is a size American 12 last. And they are making these shoes for the same company in the same style. But they are, uh, they do not have the same leather material, of course, that they had, uh, which was a, a, a softer suede leather back in 91 and 92. They're now using a harder pebble grain material. Okay. Now, with respect to the photograph that's uh, letter F on this chart, the item there that's depicted as the last, is that correct? Yes. And did you actually obtain one of those? I obtained two of them. All right. And did you uh, bring those back to the United States? Yes, sir, I did. You can resume the witness stand. I'd like to uh, mark as people's 381 for identification uh, two lasts. 
All right, 381 shoelace. And they're in a bag, excuse me, they're in a shoe box that's in a brown paper wrapping. And I'll place the exhibit number 381 on the brown paper wrapping. May I approach? You may. So showing you 381 for identification. Can you remove the contents of the package and tell us what you're doing? Exhibit 381 is the pair of lasts which were used to make the uh, shoes that I observed being made at the Silga and 4C factory. The outsole size that I observed being used at that time was the size, European size 46 sole. And these lasts are, even though they're made in Europe, are graded with an American size 12. Uh, and the reason for that is the American grading system for shoes takes into account uh, more measurements and variations than the European lasting system, which normally uh, shoes in Europe are only available perhaps in one width, maybe two widths. So because these are quality shoes, they're very expensive shoes that are made with leather, they have to be produced with a high quality uh, they use the American grading system and American lasts. Uh, on the side of one of these lasts uh, was written, when I observed it in the factory, in addition to size 12, was written the number 46. Could you place one of those lasts perhaps in the uh, size 46 outsole just so we could see how they compare? <coughs> yes, sir. All right. Now, based upon all of the information that you had from your visit to Italy, from the lasts and the souls and the photographs of the Bundy crime scene location, were you able to form an opinion regarding the size of the shoe, the size of the shoes that caused the shoe prints at the Bundy location? Yes, I was. And what's that opinion? That size was an American size 12 with the European size 46 sole attached to it. Now, do you have some additional charts that are designed to show the basis of that opinion and how you arrived at it specifically? Yes, I do. Directing your attention to uh, what I'd like to mark as people's next in order, a chart entitled reversed, excuse me, reverse shoe sole chart. 382 for identification, Your Honor. So marked. And Mr. Goldberg, 1030. Excuse me? 10.30. Okay. Thank you. Sir, directing your attention to this exhibit, it's People's 382 for identification. Can you tell us what this is? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on the top of the chart are... Uh, reverse photographs, approximately two time enlargements of photographs that I took uh, of the left soles from size 42 through 47. Uh, by reverse I mean that they were photographed and then the negative was reversed and the reason for doing that is so that the uh, your look, it's as if you were looking down through the shoe in the same configuration as if the shoe print was being laid on a two-dimensional surface. And it also makes the comparison easier for test impressions, which of course are made in that manner. So these are reverse photographs, approximately two-time enlargements of soles 42 through 47. And on the bottom of the chart is a very small portion of a test impression made with each of these soles, and it, the test impression represents the area which has the red rectangle around it on the sole above it. So on the left of the chart is the uh, corner of the uh, heel of the left shoe uh, in a six-time enlargement uh, demonstration configuration, 
and to the right of that is the 43 and so forth, all the way to the 47. Using this, go ahead. Using this chart, can you describe for us how it was that you were able to make a determination regarding shoe size? Yes, because of what I had mentioned before, the differences between the molds uh, of each size because they are hand milled uh, and because there is only in this case one mold for each size. Uh, I'm using this as a, as a demonstration of showing how the pattern, uh, drawing your attention to the upper uh, corner of this, how the pattern will vary uh, in the respective areas of each of these soles. And this is true of all areas of the heel and all er areas of the sole. But for demonstration purposes, you can see that the pattern is in a different position, even though the pattern remains the same size. Each individual design element is the same size. Well, if you take, uh, let's say, um, 42 and 43, just for illustration purposes, can you, sh can you demonstrate for us uh, how the impression cor for 42 corresponds to the sole for 42? Yes. And then also the differences with 43. Yes. Uh, the, I don't know if, it, if the sole is large enough to be seen, but looking first then at the impression, there is a fragment of part of the design element on the left border a certain distance from the top curved portion of the heel and then there's this curved area between that design element and the other half of the design element. And so you can see that there's a respective portion of this design corresponds with that area on the left shoe size 42. And the reason it corresponds is because the impression a shoe leaves uh, makes physical contact with the surface. And the physics of contact ensure that this pattern is going to be reproduced in other words, this pattern is going to represent uh, these features precisely. You wouldn't have this shoe uh, making a pattern that agreed with one of the other shoes. And then looking at the same area in 43, you can see that the, uh, there is a much bigger part of this area. Uh, this curved area has got a lot of uh, design between it and the perimeter. Uh, this has moved out a lot further, and you're starting to get the angulation here of other aspects of that design. And there's an angle up here as well. And this represents precisely what you have in the respective area of the size 43 sole. Uh, looking to the far right between the 47 and the 46, in the instance of the 47 to the far right, the manufacturer of the molds forgot to route the border, that is this line, raised line around the shoe and so the design is open. There is no connecting border. And that's very, very obvious in the impression. And then looking to the left of 47, looking at the 46 uh, impression at the bottom, there is just a drastic difference between uh, the design positioning in those shoes, uh, whereas these are a little bit closer but still distinctly different. OK, now this was done for illustration purposes, I take it. Yes, it was. But could you have done the same thing with different parts of the shoe and, and made the same kind of illustration of how you can distinguish between 42? Yes, and I, I could have done it with both shoes and I could do it for each part of the shoes, but because I would have to make uh, these so large to see for demonstration purposes, I chose to just illustrate one as an example. Do you have another exhibit uh, chart showing one of the shoe prints, or actually two of the shoe prints at the Bundy location? and how you engaged in an analysis to determine the size of those shoes. Yes, I do. I'd like to mark that as people's 383 for identification, Your Honor. It's called shoe print comparison chart. Yes. Sir, direct your attention to this chart that's entitled Shoe Print Comparison. Can you illustrate for us how it was you were able to make your comparison? Uh, maybe you can start with one of the two shoe prints. Yes, may I step and down? And move on you to may. the other. Yes, please. Okay, the, the chart entitled 
original true print comparison, on the left side uh, has one of the photographs which I examined, which is uh, a bloody shoe print from the Bundy location. Uh, at the crime scene, it was marked shoe print E. The Los Angeles Police Department called it shoe print E. And the FBI, in my report, I referred to it as Q107. Uh, it is uh, an impression of uh, both the sole and heel. On the right side uh, is another shoe print, which I marked FBI Q68 and which was down in the uh, lower walkway area at the very entrance inside the gate. And that is of a heel impression. Uh, and the, if whatever impression would have been up here would be, uh, would have been, uh, if, if the impression had been laid down up here, it would have been interfered with by the other blood in that area. So you can only really see the heel impression on FBI Q68. In the middle is, an approximate two-time enlargement of one of the test impressions I made of the left shoe using the European uh, sole uh, size 46. And attached to uh, shoe print E and the shoe print on the right and the left of the chart uh, are transparencies uh, that are made from the same test impression that's in the center. And this allows, uh, in the comparison and demonstration process, of superimposing the features that are left in test impressions of the size 46 and other size soles over top of the impressions that are examined at the crime scene. And by putting these over these impressions, the precise configuration of the design elements, as I had mentioned before, and how they meet the borders where they are visible in this print, as well as the design element and fragments of the border, which were up in this area and made from respective areas of the shoe, uh, correspond. And also, FBI Q68, the heel impression, the overlay demonstrates that as well. You can place this overlay uh, back and forth and see the corresponding pattern agrees. Using this method, I was able to take the size 42 through 47 shoes of both left and right, and I was able to make test impressions through direct physical contact in a transparency form. I was able to place these over the crime scene impressions and determine which size of the European soles made that impression and eliminate the others. And in doing so, with regard to these two, uh, I determined the left size 46 sole uh, positively made the impressions and the 42 through 45 and 47 soles could positively be eliminated. And with respect to the print on the right that says shoe print FBI Q68, even though only a heel of that is visible, you were able to determine that was a 46 European sole. Yes. How? Because the heels, like the rest of the shoe, are distinct, distinctly different. And so no other heel in the other sizes could have made that impression. Were you able to determine whether these shoe prints were made with a shoe that was manufactured on that precise mold that you saw at the Silga factory, the 46 mold? Yes, it, was, it had to have been made in that mold. There would be no other mold like it. So it was made, the, the shoe that made the impressions uh, that I've addressed here, Q107 and Q68, were positively uh, shoes that came from the Silga mold size 46. Okay. Your Honor, I was going to move on to another topic now. Do you want me to do that, uh, given that it's only 25 minutes after the hour? Well, I'll leave it to your discretion, Counsel. Do you want to forge ahead or do you want to take a break at this point? Uh, Perhaps we could take a break. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our mid-morning recess at this time. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Don't allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess for 15 minutes. And Mr. Bojack, you may step down. the uh, Simpson matter. All parties are again present. Council, anything we need to take up before we invite the jurors to rejoin us? I take that as a no. 
Deputy Magnera, sound the jurors, please. Mr. Bodziak, would you resume the witness stand, please? Mr. Bill Bodziak is on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bodziak, were you provided with any item in order to determine what the defendant's shoe size was? Yes, I was. And what were you provided with? I was provided with a pair of Reebok shoes uh, that the defendant wore. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to mark as people's next in order would be 384 for identification. Um, and I'm going to write a 384 on the exterior of the package, the package and its contents of what appear to be Reebok tennis shoes. So marked. Sir, showing the people's 384 for identification. Can you remove the item from that package and tell us what you're doing? <laughs> 384 is a pair of Reebok shoes, white in color what I would call a low profile uh, that were represented to me as the shoes of the defendant. And what did you do with those Reebok shoes? I made measurements of the uh, exterior uh, length of the sole uh, as best I could without cutting the tops off. I made measurements of the inner uh, length of the insole and I made a direct physical comparison between them and a size 12 Bruno Mali shoe. What size did you determine the Reebok shoes to be? Oh, the Reeboks are, are labeled uh, U.S. size 12. Now, sir, in making a determination of the defendant's shoe size, uh, could the, uh, why not just measure the defendant's feet instead of doing this? Uh, because of the factors of personal preference of fit uh, and other factors which come into consideration, uh, measuring the feet would not be the most accurate way of determining shoe size. In terms of getting idea, an idea of personal preference and fit, did you write a letter to Detective Lang and Venatter about wanting an other search to take place uh, in order to inventory all the defendant's shoes? Yes, I did. Why was that that you wanted that? Well, uh, I thought it would be uh, more thorough to look at all of the shoes, uh, but the shoes I had, I did make a comparison of. 
and uh, is this a fair comparison between the Reeboks and the Bruno Mollies? Yes, it is. Do you need to have the complete inventory in order to render certain opinions as to whether or not the defendant would be a candidate for having left the shoe prints at the Bundy crime scene? I'm sorry, could you rephrase that? Do, do you need to have uh, additional information other than what you have right now in order to be able to render an opinion as to whether the defendant could have deposited the shoe prints at Bundy? That he, that he would be a viable candidate? Yes. No, what I have is sufficient. All right. Now, can you uh, show us, um, in terms of a, a, a demonstration here, what you did to compare the Reeboks to the Bruno Mali shoes that you had? Yes, I, I had a size uh, 12 right Bruno Mali shoe, the one which was from the original shipment from Bruno Mali in New Jersey that Mr. Peter Gruderich had provided to me, and that is marked 12 in uh, US 12, and was the shoe that was made on the American 12 last with the 46 sole. And I took this shoe and made the same linear measurements of the outer, outer sole and inner sole and found that they were uh, within a couple millimeters of one another. Essentially, uh, they were the same. And I took the shoes and matching the heel and the toes, uh, compared the dimensions of those shoes and found that they were of similar construction and were, for all practical purposes, identical in the size and shape features. In other words, the person wearing one certainly would be a candidate for wearing the other. Uh, when I say the construction is similar, I had mentioned that the Bruno Mali shoe was what's called a cup sole. In other words, it's, uh, I guess, because it could hold water, it comes up around the edge and you uh, that particular type of shoe construction, in this case, was compression molded. And with regard to the Reebok shoe, uh, there's also a cup, a cup sole. In this case, it's cut down uh, in the midline of the shoe on the medial and lateral uh, portion of it. And that's referred to in the industry as a half cup sole, but the construction is the same. And this also would be compression molded. and it would, the sole would be molded separately and the upper would be lasted and lowered down and glued and stitched to the outsole. So these shoes are uh, viable for a comparison in terms of the dimensions and the shapes of them. And you said you also did the, the linear interior measurements. Yes. All right, and for the record, Your Honor, when he was doing his demonstration in court, he held the uh, Bruno Mali size 12 which shoe, which comes from the box 375 up against the Reebok, which comes from the bag and its contents, which was uh, 384 for identification, held them together with the soles, and they appeared to be the same dimension. So noted. Now, sir, in your uh, book, Footwear Impression, evidence, did you discuss any materials uh, relating shoe size to height? Yes, I did. And did you uh, also do a study yourself of that issue? I did a study which was concerning the bare feet impressions and barefoot dimensions of people, and part of that study reflected a chart which related the size of a person's foot to their height. Your Honor, I'd like to mark as people's 385 for identification, a um, page out of Mr. Bozziak's book, uh, just the chart portion. It says height calculation chart. What page is that from, Council? Let me double check, because I, I cut it off on the Xerox. That was in Chapter 6, Mr. Bozziak. Yes. The first chart is on 175. Could we have this, Your Honor, is 385A. 385A. I wrote a 385A on the piece of paper.
5A and have you identify that for us. We're going to project it up on the screen. I think you have a. Okay. Yes. Well, that's supposed to be a 385A, Your Honor, that I wrote on there. It doesn't. Looks more like a 383. Uh, sir, what is that? Uh, this is uh, a chart entitled Height Calculation Chart. It reflects a study conducted by Inspector Mike Cassidy of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and it was first published in his book in 1980. And in terms of his study, what findings did he make regarding a size 12 shoes? Uh, this particular chart was to relate the range of height of people in his study to a shoe size. And for the size 12 shoe, he has the range of height as six feet to six foot four inches. Okay, and that's indicated on the uh, chart where he has six feet to six four, and then right underneath there's a 12. It's the third item down from the, from the right. That's correct. Okay, now if we could mark as people's 385B for identification. Mr. Bodziak's uh, chart, which is on page 174 of his book. So showing you what we've just marked as uh, people's 385B for identification. Do you recognize this? Yes, I do. What is it? Uh, this is a, a chart which I prepared uh, as part of the survey of a total of 500 people, 399 which were males, and it reflects the correlation between the shoe size of a person and the height of that person. And is one of the lines on this chart pertain to a American size 12 shoe? Yes, it does. And can we zoom in on that perhaps? All right. Well, now we, we don't really have any reference point. But uh, with respect to your study, sir, what findings did you make with respect to uh, the height of men that wear size 12 shoes? The height uh, range uh, was 71 to 77 inches. 71 being 5'11". 5'11 to 6 foot 5. Okay. Thank you. Sir, have there also been studies that have been done related to what percentage of the American population wears a size 12 shoe? Yes, there is. And what findings have been made along those lines? Uh, there's a group called Footwear Market Insights, which publishes uh, their study of uh, approximately 260 to 300 million pairs of shoes sold in this country, uh, and they break down the various shoe sizes and widths of the shoes sold. And this is produced for the footwear industry for their use. And what percentage wears size 12 shoes? Counting all of the shoes sold, a general uh, percentage is slightly over 9% for size 12. Did they have a breakdown with um, a dress shoes as opposed to casual shoes and so yes, on? Yes, they did. There was a very slight difference? Uh, yes, there was like 0.1 to maybe 0.4%, depending on whether it was an athletic shoe or a, a formal dress shoe or a woman's shoe or so forth. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to the items that <clears throat> you looked at from the Bundy location, did you actually see footprints at Bundy or did you look at them and analyze them through photographs? I looked at them through photographs. And is it common for you to analyze footprints using photographs? Yes, it is. Are there problems that you've encountered, generally speaking? There can be problems with photographs if the photographs aren't taken properly. Uh, if the photograph is out of focus, uh, if there's no scale in the photograph, if the photographs are taken at an, a sharp angle, then, of course, the ability to interpret and make a direct physical comparison uh, is hindered. And so in that respect, uh, photographs, if not taken properly, can be a problem. How common is it for you to have difficulties in trying to make interpretations from photographs that are submitted to you by a variety of law enforcement agencies? It's not uncommon at all for us to get uh, photographs that are far from what we would like to have. 
And in terms of the photographs that you were provided by the Los Angeles Police Department that were taken for comparison purposes, what was the quality of those photographs in terms of being able to do a comparison? Yeah, I, the photographs that were taken of the footwear impressions at this scene were taken uh, in the prescribed method in as much as they were taken from directly over top with the film plane parallel to the, to the ground. They were taken with a linear scale, such as a ruler, with a finely divided uh, scale on it. And that would be for use to enlarge those photographs back up to the natural size, the exact size that those appeared at at the crime scene. Uh, and they were taken all in focus. All of the ones which I saw were in focus. And they also used both color and black and white, with, which in regard to blood impressions is often very useful to have both because in some instances the color will assist the interpretation of the photograph. Were there any photographs that captured footprints that were not taken in that manner? In other words, that were not for comparison purposes but just happened to capture a footprint? Yes, there was one, there was one photograph which I had enlargements made of which was on the step, one of the steps near the front gate. And that was taken at an angle uh, with a, without a ruler next to the impressions. And I don't think the intention when that photograph was taken was necessarily for those impressions. Uh, but it's the only photograph I saw those depicted in. And then there were some other uh, impressions which were photographed going down steps near the back of the walkway. And those were, were not really full impressions of any comparison value, but rather just uh, rubbings of blood over the corner of the steps. And so it wasn't essential to have them taken in that method. Now, um, did you eventually visit the uh, crime scene on February the 15th of this year? Yes, I did. Did you go alone or with someone? Uh, I went there with Dennis Fung and with Vic Petrozzoni. For what purpose were you going there? Uh, I went there to uh, take the photographs, the natural size photographs I had of those footwear impressions to confirm the orientation, in other words, the direction, east versus west or north, direction they were heading, and determine for uh, preparation purposes of a chart the uh, tiles that they were on or the various steps that they were on. Were you able to do that? Yes, I was. And what did you do when you were at the crime scene in terms of looking at the photograph in the crime scene in order to make that relationship? Were you looking at yes. tiles or, Be or what? Because of the irregularity of the tiles, the concrete tiles, and cracks and blemishes in the, in the surface of the concrete and the steps and the tiles, uh, it was very easy to confirm uh, precisely which photograph came from which portion of the sidewalk. Now, before getting into the uh, Bundy crime scene in a little more detail, do you also have a chart that's been prepared to show, generally speaking, how footprints can be deposited at a crime scene? Yes, I do. And I'd like to mark as people's next in order a chart that's entitled Footwear Impressions After Stepping in Liquid. That is uh, going to be people's 386 for identification, Your Honor. So marked. Sir, directing your attention to the uh, chart that we've just marked as People's 386 for identification, the t top portion. Can you describe for us what that's showing? Yes, the, the top portion is an artist's rendering of what occurs when a person uh, tracks or walks through liquid. And liquid could be uh, water, liquid could be blood, liquid could be grease or any oil or any other type of opaque material which would adhere to the shoe and then be laid down as the person took the next succession of steps. And what this depicts and what actually happens is the first step after leaving this liquid, uh, the impression is very dark because it has a fresh coating of this material on it. And as the foot presses down, it presses that liquid out to the different edges of each design element and therefore removing some of that liquid from the surface. 
So the next step that would be taken with that foot would be lighter. It would not be, would not have as much material in it, so it would be lighter. And eventually, uh, as you continue the walk, uh, there will no longer be any impressions being left because all of that material will be off the uh, flat surface, the surface that normally touches the ground. <coughs> Uh, will no longer have that material on it. There may be, uh, in the case of blood or, or water or any other type of liquid, there may be other material up in the cracks and crevices and the little edges, but not on the surface that typically leaves the impression. Now, in terms of the impressions that we have here under where it says the detail, the degree of detail retained in the impression varies, did you create those test impressions? Yes, I did. And uh, I assume you didn't use blood in, in No, I, I, I used a uh, blue-colored latex paint. Now, on occasions, have you uh, made impressions that were actually in blood, test impressions? Yes, I make them all of the time for classes which I teach, uh, where we then enhance those impressions in blood, and also to demonstrate what I've just described, where the, the impressions get slightly lighter and eventually disappear. Now, on these three test impressions that you made, were these consecutive? In other words, was the one on the left-hand side of the diagram number one, the one in the middle two, and the one on the right three, or there were, were there ones in between? No, this particular uh, chart, this is a uh, computer scanning of the actual, of a photograph, black and white photograph, of the actual impressions. The low one on the left being number one for the right foot, the n one in the middle being the second time the right foot struck the ground, and the one on the right being the third time the right foot struck the ground. Can you give us an estimation as to how quickly footprints in blood may disappear to the point where you wouldn't see anything that you could recognize as a shoe print? You might just see lines or squiggles or whatever. Uh, there, there will be things that cause variables that as the porosity of the surface, uh, the amount of blood that's initially stepped on, whether it's a pool of blood or whether it's blood that has already been coating a surface is, is rather flat, which, which wouldn't be uh, as three-dimensional. Uh, but if, if there's a heavy coating of blood, it normally disappears in approximately uh, six to ten steps. What, what was porosity? When uh, the amount of uh, absorption and pores in the surface. Uh, this countertop would be non-porous. It would be very smooth. And uh, a very porous object, of course, would be a sponge. And concrete or concrete tiles are very porous. They would absorb the liquid and therefore cause it to dry quicker. Were you, when you were making this, the test impressions, is this on a porous surface or, or a relatively unporous? It was on a rough, uh, a, a rough piece of paper, not a smooth finished paper, but a, a piece of brown craft paper that you would use for wrapping. Now, um, can you uh, indicate for us using this chart the kinds of uh, problems that you can confront in terms of patterns appearing different than they really would on the shoe as a result of the blood uh, bleeding over or, or other kinds of problems that you might have along those lines. Yes, may I step down? Yes. If I can use the sole as well as the picture, uh, I mentioned before the individual design elements, which are these little designs that together make up the total pattern on the shoe. And I also mentioned the uh, slightly raised perimeter, which uh, confines the design elements in the sole, as well as that slightly raised perimeter, which confines the design elements in the heel. And that perimeter and these design elements, if you look at the shoe from the side, will both touch the surface if the surface is flat. The outer perimeter is raised. It's actually above the level of the ground, but it's very, very close. So if there is a lot of liquid, such as blood, on this outer perimeter, depending on the amount of blood and depending on the pressure exerted in a particular shoe impression, you may get this secondary perimeter, which on the first impression here is almost complete around the heel and is also in other portions of the sole, the top left corner. Uh, you also, because there's a lot of material on the shoe with the first step, there's also uh, more of a printing of the 
flat surface of the design element, in other words, the actual pattern of the design element, but you can see uh, darkened edges which represent that material being squeezed out. And this is known as a squeegee effect, where the pressure is causing this uh, material, whether it be blood or paint, uh, to squeeze out to the edge of the design element. And the same would also be true where there's excess blood in other areas, such as the perimeter, <coughs> this would squeeze out. In the second step, uh, there is now going to be less material on the sole, and most of the material on the flatter surfaces of the design element has been squeezed away, so it is very thin. But where it, the edges are, where that material has been squeezed out to and through surface tension will remain, you will get more of a printing of the edge characteristics of the design element and except in areas where, for instance, there are a couple here where you do see a filling in of the design, you're basically getting the edge characteristics and you're getting less of the perimeter because there's less material on that secondary outer edge. The third step, again, you're getting some partial outer edge, but now you're really getting just the perimeter of the design element. And in areas down where I'm pointing to now, down in the sole area, but on the heel side, you're starting to get just little speckles and portions, perhaps little corners or edges of that design element. And then the succeeding steps you would get less and less until eventually you would not be able to recognize this as this pattern. Okay, is, is that why when you're looking at an impression at a crime scene, certain features of the design characteristics might not be apparent or might look a little bit different? Yes, if you were looking at uh, this impression or perhaps the next impression that would be made. Uh, it might not look to you if you weren't trained. If you weren't trained and experienced in looking at this, it may superficially look like a different pattern initially. Okay. Perhaps we could could pass around that uh, sole. The I think it's the 46 sole that he has, Your Honor, which was 379. While this chart is up, so they could get a All right, better Mr. Bill Dagg, hand that to jury number one, please. But while we're waiting, I don't know whether the court wants to do that. Oh, we're just about to. Okay, all right. I'd like the jury to have their undivided attention. Okay. All right, Mr. Goldberg, would you retrieve uh, the sole from uh, Deputy Russell? All right, Mr. Goldberg.
Now, you were talking about how when you went to the uh, Bundy location, you were going out to compare the photographs to uh, the tiles at the location. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, I do. And that was for the purposes of creating a chart? That's correct. Now, I'd like to uh, mark as people's next in order, that would be 387 for identification. Uh, it's actually a two-part board, Your Honor. Uh, so maybe we should mark it 388, 387A as the first section, and B is the second. All right, so marked. Perhaps with the court's permission, we could use this chart closer to the jury because, uh, thank you. I can uh, mark as people's next in order a series of photographs uh, of what appear to be shoe prints from the Bundy location as 388, a photograph that's Q68, as 389, a photograph that's Q67. And then, uh, Your Honor, there are a series of photographs that are A through P. They already have eight, the letters A through P on them. I'd like to mark as 390A through 390P. Uh, a photograph that has the letter S on it as 391. X would be 392. Y would be 393. Q116, 394. And there's only one unlettered item, and I'd like that to be 395. So, Mark. All right, Mr. Bailey, can you see this? Uh, Mr. Bodziak, uh, directing your attention to the chart that we've just put, put up of uh, what appears to be the Bundy location that's been marked as 387A for identification. Do you recognize what this shows? You're going to have to ask him to step down because I think the yeah, angle is too severe. Step down. Yes, I do. All right, and the legend of this is on the other side of the uh, chart. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Can you tell us what the um, color codes mean in ter starting with the uh, purple shoe prints? The purple shoe prints, <clears throat> such as uh, is indicated here in B, uh, represent the right foot, the right foot impression, and the pink or red, whichever you choose to call it, uh, as represented by D as an example, are the left footprints. And the medium colored blue, uh, sort of without a footprint shape to them, those represent ones which were too indistinct. In other words, the uh, impression had worn down to the point where they were too in indistinct to attribute to either that design issue or to a particular left or right. And Mr. Bodziak, is this the chart that you were referring to when you were talking about how you went out to the crime scene with Mr. Fun? Yes, sir. All right. Your Honor, I I'm going to uh, pause for a moment just to let counsel, uh, if they want to get a closer look at the chart. Certainly. Thank you. When we were previously talking about the shoe print comparison chart, were some of the items that you um, referred to on that chart represented on the Spundy chart as well? Yes, they were. And which items were those? Uh, they were Q68, which was that left heel impression, and 
the impression uh, which is depicted with the letter E, which was also a left impression, and which is further up the walkway. Okay. Uh, maybe we can start then just very briefly with the Q68. Uh, if you'd like to, perhaps you can show us showing you people's 388 for identification. Uh, what you did in terms of comparing that, that footprint, and since we've covered it, maybe you can just indicate for us how it was yes. in uh, brief how you did it. Q68 is the same heel impression which I previously uh, demonstrated with an overlay, and this just shows the natural size rendition of, of that with, uh, which is what I would have compared, which what I did compare, with the actual original impressions that I made of the left and right soles from size 42 through 47. Okay, and was this the area of the scene that's the, uh, where you would enter into the gated off or, or fenced off area? Yes, this is the front gate uh, that, which is running across the walkway and Q68 is pretty close in the corner and it is headed in the direction of the arrow which is on the tip of Q68. So if I were to hold this up, it would be headed in this direction. Okay. And actually, the uh, print was, you said, just a heel print. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But on our chart, it, it has a full little footprint as the icon. Just for it, it? to recognize left and right, okay. we put a full foot on each of these. All right. And the arrow would indicate the direction. Yes, sir. 